Could you just introduce yourself? <coughs> I'll be speaking about this volume. My name is Alan Rasbridger, and I'm the editor of The Guardian for a bit longer. Now, I want to get into a, a wider conversation about what The Guardian is doing with putting uh, climate change front and central, and what you see as some of the issues or maybe pitfalls of covering climate change in the media. But first, I, I wanted to get the story of how this came about. I understand a big spark for it was a, a lunch you had with Bill McKibben, the the founder of 350.org and environmental activist. Uh, c- could you take me to that lunch? Uh, what was the scene and, and what was the conversation? Well, we were both recipients of a, a rather wonderful award called the Right Livelihood Award in Stockholm. And the organizers of this award, um, they don't like the people just to come in and pick up the gong and fly off. They like to put them together and um, see what connections are made. So we, we spent a couple of days in each other's company and one day I found myself sitting next door to Bill who I hadn't met before I was familiar with his work a a bit and we ended up talking about climate change and I was asking about you know what journalism could do better and he said well the thing is the mistake that I think newspapers are making media organizations generally is to cover it through environment cover correspondence and they've done a great job, but the story has now moved beyond the environment. It's now about the politics. It's about the economics. Uh, and I think you ought to wake up and change the nature of the way that you're covering. So that was a very Im- important conversation that I sort of squirreled away in the back of my mind. And, but what did he mean by that? So instead of it being about the environment, it being more about power, what, did, what does that actually mean? Well, I think he meant that except to the, the fringes of the deniers and skeptics, the science is settled. Um, we, we know the dangers of uh, climate change. We know roughly how many degrees um, can be tolerated and the consequences of, of breaking through those targets. Uh, we know it's man-made, etc., etc., etc. So you know, all those things that environmental correspondents used to write about, we can take as a given. But how to solve it is not going to be the environmental correspondence. That's going to be people who understand different kinds of power, economic, chiefly economic and political power. You said that it's not like you weren't proud of the environmental coverage that The Guardian had done. You, you had devoted quite a number of people and resources to the environment over the years. But you felt like you had never actually broken through. You had never actually been able to convey sort of the urgency of the issue. Why do you think that's the case? Why wasn't that able to come through? Well, I think there is a no, not a problem with journalism. It's just what journalism is. Journalism describes things that have happened. Uh, and, you know, if somebody shoots somebody or a bomb goes off or somebody falls over in the street, that's a relatively simple thing for journalism to handle. You can photograph it. You can describe it. Uh, if you're saying these are things that could happen in 20 years' time if we don't do things today, that's much harder. Uh, especially if you've got people standing on the other side of the street saying, well, I don't agree, I don't think those things will happen. And so you get into an argument about whether these things are likely to happen or not. Uh, But it's all in the future. Meanwhile, things are changing not every day. Um, you, you, You know, the iceberg will look the same today as it looked yesterday. So it's very incremental changes that are happening. And journalism is about the novel. Um... And I think there's also something about the readers. We can't let the readers off. I think, you know, the readers find this a difficult subject. Um, it's it's very threatening. It's very frightening. It feels like there's nothing they can do about it. And so this story, which to my mind is the most important story of our lives, um, and which on any rational basis should be on the front page every day, almost never is. So that's that's the problem. And this happened to coincide with your decision to step down after 20 years as the, the editor. And so can you tell me about, after meeting with Bill McKibben, what you were left thinking about? Was it a, a decision right away that you wanted to do something more, that you wanted to devote this time? Well, it, it, it was over Christmas, so, you know, a, a time of reflection. It was, you know, the first time I escaped the office and was sitting in an armchair by a log fire with a glass of wine, and that's a good time to start thinking. And I was thinking, you know, what's next year going to bring? Six months' time, I won't be editor any longer. What, what if anything, will I regret? And I thought, well... There is this nagging thing in the back of my mind that, that we haven't 
really managed to make people sit up and notice this subject in the way that I think they should be. And if they're not, then politicians are not going to feel the breath of public opinion on their necks. And so what, what could I do in, in six months that, that would dramatize and energize uh, our, our coverage? Uh, and that's how this began. It began with an email from me to my colleagues on Christmas Eve, which um, no colleague wants to receive an email from their editor on Christmas Eve. Um, but it did kickstart a conversation internally, which led to the campaign that we're now in the middle of. And, and what, what's the actual nature of the campaign? Can you explain what you've committed to? Well, so, so when, we, when we came back in January, we, we, we decided we wanted to do a campaign. Uh, there were some people who thought that should, it should be more aimed at the political end of things because they believed that in the end it's going to have to be a form of carbon tax or regulation on, on carbon that that seemed entirely plausible, but I thought it wasn't going to do any better than anything else we'd done in waking people up or energizing them, because that's all about politics, which is done in smoke-filled rooms or not-so-smoke-filled rooms nowadays. Um, but nevertheless, everyone else feels shut out of that. So I was more attracted, and this is where my, my mind went back to Bill McKibben, to the work that he'd done, which seemed to me a, a movement that was much more energizing, much more evolving, had momentum, which was about not funding the people who were causing the problem um, and, and changing the nature of how people perceived these companies and uh, either morally or pragmatically um, pulling your money out of them. And can you explain some of the math behind that reasoning? Well, I mean, Bill wrote a very influential piece in, in Rolling Stone a, a couple of years ago, which just used three figures, about which I think there is broad consensus. Uh, and it's a very simple way of thinking about it. So the first figure is two degrees. Uh, and I think most people, most rational people, agree that if we go above two degrees of warming, then we get into not just environmental problems, but huge societal uh, stability problems, uh, economic problems the world over. So that, that is something that will affect millions and millions of people. So if we get beyond two degrees. The, the, the second figure is the amount of coal, gas and oil that is in the ground. Uh, and which is owned by uh, either states or very large companies. And the third figure is the amount of that that can be safely burned and still stay within the two degrees. And the point of McKibben's article was to say that the overwhelming majority of these fossil fuels need to stay on the ground, can never be burned if you're to stay within two degrees. So if you accept that premise and, and actually... I haven't seen many people quarreling with the mass, then the very large fossil fuel companies are valued entirely unrealistically. They are valued on the basis of the reserves they have, which can never be used if mankind's to survive. So what you're, dis what you're seeing is a kind of asset bubble, a bit like subprime mortgages, uh, which uh, will come back to haunt us, I think. So that's the, that's the basis of the campaign, that you need to get out. If you're invested in this stuff, you should disinvest, divest. Uh, and that is a, an argument that is now beginning to rage around the world. Why do you think there's been such a easy sort of cognitive distance that, that most people have had with this? I mean, even when you, it's interesting when you talk to, you've been in talks more or less when with, the, the two foundations that you're trying to through the campaign to divest the, the Gates Foundation primarily in America. And there's a disconnect because they're, of course, wanting to help the world. That's the, their goal. And yet, by that simple math that you just laid out, clearly, you can't have both. You can't both invest in something that is destined to destroy the, the world as we know it and still have, fulfill your mission. And, and I think this goes for the personal level, too. Do you see a source for that? Is it just a, a, a nature of human psychology? Well, I think, um, I mean, I, I understand their arguments. So the, the Gates argument is, well, we, we do good in the world. And it's true. They're a, they're a wonderful foundation and they, they have done amazing good in the world. 
and they say we 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 want to maximize our revenues in order to do good and that's just the way it is Welcome Trust say something different, and again, they're, they're a wonderful uh, trust in, investing in science and medicine and health. They say, well, we are invested in these companies, but we think our greatest influence can be by engaging with them and persuading them to change. And if we, if we got out of them, then we would lose that influence. So whether you think that is a sensible attitude or not depends on, I think, whether you think they are persuading them to change whether they have any influence. And I you know, we've spoken to lots of people who have tried engaging with these companies over the years and say, look, ultimately, it's pointless. You, you know, they are, like it or not, they are oil companies or coal companies. That's what they do. And they're not going to change. Um, but, I, you know, I, I can follow intellectually the position that says it's better to be on the inside trying to have some influence. I just haven't seen any proof that it's working. I'd be curious to hear about your own sort of history with climate change. I, I read that uh, it's something that for a while you thought might be the biggest issue of our time. Uh, when did you first get really concerned about climate change? Well, I think, I think it's been growing on me over the last 10, 15 years. I remember when I became editor, I think we had one science correspondent, one environment correspondent, and at its peak, I think we've We've got a staff of about eight, eight to ten people now in those areas, and it seemed to me that that was that that was a rational way of thinking about the world. That, that issues to do with science, engineering, technology, environment, and not just climate, but um, species, water, drought, all the all the all the issues that our environment team cover. That these were huge, important issues for our times. And that it would it, it was odd to have five people down at Westminster covering Westminster politics and one person covering the environment. That just felt wrong. And so then we appointed an environment correspondent in China. The, the person we have in South America is very occupied doing the environment. Ditto in India, ditto in, in Washington. We have a full-time environment correspondent in, in North America. And and we, we have mounted campaigns in, in the past. So as I say, it's not that we've ignored it. I think we've done it well. I just think that, I think as, as journalists, this is not just The Guardian, as journalists generally, we need to think about our duty, our responsibilities in this area. And, uh, you know, if our role is to inform readers so that they can plan their own lives and, and have more effect on the political system, then we're not necessarily succeeding. I know for myself, it's an issue that I've been concerned on and off with for years. The thing about climate change is that for so long in the coverage and, and just in the conception of it, it's such a big problem. And it's one that any one individual, it seems like you can do nothing. And so I know for me, there'd be periods where I would worry about it a lot. And then there'd be a long period where I wouldn't I wouldn't read about it. I, I think I would even be avoiding the articles subconsciously in the in the newspaper, mm. and then eventually something would spook me, and I'd start paying attention. I was I was wondering if that was the case with you as well. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I'm sure I'm. You know, it's, I'm not obsessed by it. I haven't been obsessed by it. You know, continually over 15 years. I, I think, like you, I've I've um, I've had periods when I've um, stopped reading about it. Um, the, the the people on the other side of the debate are brilliant at reducing it to sort of silly things. So you know that oh, how how can you write about climate change if you drive that car, or how can how can you write about climate change if you uh, took that flight? Um, and so there are lots of sort of diversionary tactics, and which which do you you know you think well I, if I can't even change my own life, or uh, but even if I do change my own life, I don't take that flight. I take the train. Is that really going to make uh, any difference. So I think one of the reasons that the, the subject becomes mired is that is through those kind of sort of personal discussions about personal behavior. And it's, I'm not saying those aren't important, but they're not what's going to make any difference. So the point of this campaign was to shift it away from questions of consumption and very much onto the issues of production. I think one of the, the strengths of, of that position and the strength of uh, the idea of, of leaving in the ground is it, it gives that focus that otherwise the coverage before was was lacking, where all you'd hear about is melting ice sheets or another record season of, of temperatures and yet feel 
basically uh, neutered against it. You can't, you, you had no power. Uh, can you talk about how important it was to to narrow the focus in, as part of uh, this coverage? I, I, I think that's or, right. Or the, or the movement? Yeah, least. well, I think that's right. I, I think people do. I mean, I, that, you know, there's psychologists have written, um, you know, entire bookshelves of books now about why people find this so difficult to think about and whether it's too frightening or whether it's a, a, a lack of power or lack of agency so that, that you can't do anything yourselves. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was to just narrow the focus into something that was about one thing and every time in a discussion with colleagues when they tried to say well don't you think we ought to have a view about this or about that or you know we should be doing I kept on saying no we, that's what you're talking about is environment coverage you know we do that every other week of the year this is just about one thing and we're going to just pursue this remorselessly until we've really pursued it to the the end that we can and i i think we've stuck to that i think you know we're, we're being very very focused on this one thing and it you know people people have woken up it, you know people have noticed it and it's had i mean more I mean, there's you know big stories we've done in the past few years like snowden and phone hacking this is up there with them in terms of people around the world sitting up and noticing that here is a you know a, a newspaper doing something very unusual and important and for you, is that was the importance in that to escape that sense of fatalism that had otherwise dominated the topic? Yeah, well, it's re- <laughs> it is interesting watching the reaction. So, um, you know, lots of cross articles in other papers saying, "Oh, you sh- this is one today in the Times." You know, you, this is the wrong campaign, or it's the the, the wrong target, or um, this won't have any effect. And I feel like saying to them, "Well, you come on then, you know." Um, that's fine. What, what what have you done in the last forty years? You know, and there are some journalists I know who, you know, about my age, who have been in journalism for 35, 40 years. You know, um, you don't like our campaign? Great. You know, what what are you going to tell your grandchildren about what you did uh, about this issue? Or don't you think it's that important? Um, you know, because I think what we are we're throwing a challenge at the rest of journalism. You know, if you you don't like our campaign, that's fine. Um, what actually are you doing? Or don't you think this is a a vital issue. Um, if not, why not? Those, those are the challenges I would like to throw back at people who who uh, disagree with what we're doing. Well, one of the main issues or main criticisms that would be leveled uh, at this sort of coverage and the, at this uh, this campaign you're doing is that you know it's not objective journalism, and I, I think this is a particularly strong idea in in North America. Uh, but I was curious about your views on that. Is do you think objective journalism is is a possible or if it is, be desirable? Mm. Well, let, let, let's suppose the scientists are right. Um, let, let's suppose that we're heading for a... Uh, if, if we don't act, then we're heading for something like a catastrophe for, for life as we know it. Um, why would you be objective about that if, if um, the overwhelming body of scientific opinion believe that that was likely to happen why, why you know why, why would you want to remain calm in those circumstances and uh, you know i can see that you know i've been in journalism for a long time it's uh, and i understand about the arguments about objectivity and impartiality and fairness and accuracy and all that so i don't need lectures from people uh, about that but what, but what is objective journalism doing in this area and, and w- well what is objective journalism um I mean, you, you you do hear on some broadcasters the need to you know balance somebody who believes in climate change or somebody who doesn't believe in climate change is that objective when when the uh, scientific opinion is so overwhelmingly balanced towards one side of the argument so I think these are these are complex decisions, and again, you could spend all your life talking about them and worry about whether this is a good thing to do or a bad thing to do. But all the time that you're worrying about that, not doing it, then you know we're one week closer to the Paris talks, one week closer to things not happening. Uh, and I don't think it's a bad thing for one newspaper to um, break free of that and introduce a little urgency into the subject. Have you noticed any any differences in the media coverage, or either in, towards climate change or towards the campaign itself by the Guardian that's surprised you, or, or that you could uh, characterize? Well, I, I, um, 
I mean, in, in this country, I thought there would be more hostility, um, but there hasn't been. And uh, you know, may, maybe that's because of actually self-reflection, people thinking, well, it, it'd be easy to knock the guard in, but, but actually, what are we doing? Because I think actually a lot of journalists do feel uh, uneasy about this, you know, because journalists are human beings. We've all got our own lives. Um, uh, uneasy about climate change, you mean? Well, I think, no, I think they feel uneasy about what they're doing. You know, I mean, if you've got young friends, young relatives, you've got children, you've got grandchildren, you've got godchildren, uh, you know, we're all in touch with future, future generations. And I think you, you have to be quite an odd person not to, not to think about what might be happening and, and, and whether you're doing all the things that you could do personally to, um, to have some kind of effect. So I, I, think, I think that may be one reason why, why actually we haven't been criticized in the way that I thought we might be. I mean, around, around the rest of the world, there's just been interest. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean I've done lots, lots of interviews in, in the US where this question of objectivity has come up, but, but not, not in a hostile way. I mean, you know, people are genuinely interested, uh, and I think it's making American editors reflect on whether the tried and tested J school tenets of what journalism is um, are the only whether that is the only way to do journalism. And I, I think new media doesn't work like that. Uh, and maybe old media will change a bit. You mentioned you've done uh, many, many interviews, and I was wondering what, what it's been like for you to be the the face of this this campaign in one of the podcasts. Uh, yeah, it comes across that you're you're quite uh, reticent to <laughs> to uh, put yourself as the sort of the de facto spokesperson for this. Uh, what has that been like? Well, I, um, I'm a slightly reticent person uh, anyway, so I, I I didn't want to I didn't want the story to be about. Well, I certainly didn't want the story about to be about me, um, and I, I I didn't I only wanted the story to be about the Guardian to the extent that it would provoke discussion and. Um, you know, because it, it would be better if people discussed the issue itself. Um, but I, that, but I think that the story of how journalism is or isn't doing with this subject is an interesting and important one, and and provides a lens or a route into the subject itself. So I, I, I don't mind doing it as long as it, it causes people to reflect on the on the subject itself. Now you featured, I think, two chapters of, of Naomi Klein's book, or, or two excerpts at least. And of course, her thesis is the idea that, that climate change changes everything and that serious action uh, taken against climate change is fundamentally incompatible with the current you know, economic system we, we live under. Uh, I, I was wondering what your view on that is. Uh, well, I, um, I, I think I mean, some people have read the title of her book, This Changes Everything, to mean that she wants this to change everything and um, we're nervous about the book because... You know, she's a person of the left, and you know, was was this a kind of sort of leftist manifesto? I I didn't read it that way. I, I thought, I thought she was just describing that thing, things had to change in order for us to wake up to the enormity of of what was happening. Uh, and I think I think she was right. I mean, that's why I found her book interesting. You know, she she wasn't she's she's not a scientist. She's not an environmentalist. She wasn't. Um, she was approaching this as a as a writer. Uh, and the more she thought about it and talked to people, the, the more the realization came that this does change everything. That you know, many, many, many things will have to change in order for society to take the dramatic action that we need to take. Um, and so, I, you know, and she writes well. Uh, and I thought that that is actually a very good general introduction to this subject from someone who's come to it new and fresh. But do you think? Do you think that? serious action on climate change can be taken under the sort of current political economic system? Well, I, I suppose the jury is out on that. Um, I mean, at, at, at some point, humankind will wake up to the, to the unanswerable connection between climate events and the thing that science is describing and put these two things together. Now, whether that happens too late or whether it happens while we're still in a position to 
to do something about it is is the question on which humanity is going to hinge. And that's a sort of very profound behavioral, psychological, political question um, that it's difficult to anticipate how, as a species, we're going to negotiate that. One of the interesting things about The Guardian is, is it's a nonprofit. It's run by a trust. And uh, The Guardian Media Group, I think there's a, an endowment of, of something like 600 million. Is that right? Yeah, we're ne- ne- nearly a, a billion pounds now. Yeah. A billion pounds. Okay. Um, I was wondering what role or to, or to what degree that matters, uh, The Guardian's sort of financial structure in being able to tackle such a subject. And if you think that a, a for-profit newspaper, such as the New York Times or basically most of the media, if they would have the same freedom uh, going after something that you know would upset powerful interests. Well, there's probably two answers to that. I mean, there would be nothing stopping Rupert Murdoch or the New York Times doing this. You know, they're, they're much wealthier than we are. Um, you know, we, we've got money in the bank, but we're not a, a big player. We're not a Time Warner or an AOL or a NBC or a CNN. You know, any, any of these companies could do, could afford to do it if they wanted to. Um, we've just chosen to do it. Uh, but it's, it is obviously easier to make those decisions if you haven't got shareholders breathing down your neck or... or um, you know, consultants coming in telling you how to run a lean business efficiently, which has happened to a lot of newspapers generally and not to great effect. Uh, and I'm sure any management consultant coming into The Guardian could run their slide rule over what we're doing and say, I don't understand why you've got 10 people doing this. You know, where's the revenue? Um, it's not going to make shareholders happy necessarily yeah. to uh, yeah. <laughs> put climate change front and center. It's just cost, um, and I can I can easily imagine the consultant that would come in and look at the traffic um, and the readership and say this this doesn't make sense, and that would be their judgment. But the most successful newspapers are generally not run by accountants; they're run by editors who make moral and editorial choices about what's important and about the resources that should go into them, which would seem inexplicable to many accountants. And we're blessed at having the Scott Trust, which allows the editor the freedom to make those kinds of choices within reason. And uh, so it's, it's probably true that it's more likely that a paper like The Guardian is going to do this than, than some other papers won't get mentioned. Yeah, helps helps be freed from from a purely profit motive. Yeah, I mean, the, the Guardian. The, um, there was a great Guardian editor, C. P. Scott, who was editor for fifty seven years, amazingly. And during that time, he he bought the Guardian, he owned it, and and when he died, his family set up Scott Trust. But in the um, in very, he wrote a very famous essay in nineteen twenty one, the centenary of the Guardian. It's got a very famous sentence about comment is free, but facts are sacred, but. He also has a passage in which he said a newspaper is much more than a business. And he said if the primary purpose of The Guardian had simply been to make money, he wouldn't have been interested in it. That, that's not why he got out of bed in the morning thinking, Let, let's check the share price of The Guardian. The only measure for him was whether this was a paper that was revealing important things, that was influencing important debates. That was what a newspaper was. Uh, and of course... It had to be sustainable in the long run, but um, it didn't really matter whether it was making vast profits or not. And that was totally relevant to him. And that's why he was one of the greatest editors of all time. I mean, you've you've been at the helm for 20 years, and it's been a, a very turbulent 20 years for, for journalism. The entire revenue model has, has been turned upside down. Uh, and it's it's seen a lot of struggles, a lot of downsizing throughout the industry at newspapers. What is your feeling on the state of journalism right now and, and that problem of, of financing it? Well, the financing is obviously an, an, a completely unknown open question, though you know, lots of people are um, making quite good progress with entirely different models. Uh, and it's much easier to do that now than it was in 2008 when you know, we were all reeling from you know an enormous world recession. So there was a very sticky period when the very expensive period that we're going through at the moment of of investment and cost 
uh, coincided with the bottom dropping out of the advertising market, and that coincided with the the, the technological drivers that were sucking advertising out and forcing us to to do things in a different way. So it feels to me as so though we're we're through the worst of it. Uh, the Guardian made eighty million pounds last year from digital advertising, which is not yet enough. But when I think of the people who five years ago were saying. There's no money in digital. You're wasting your time. You can never make it work. I think they've gone a bit quiet. Uh, so it's still a problem waiting a solution, a definitive solution. But I think we're as well done the road of finding the answer as anybody else. Yeah, and but the Guardian is still operating at a, at a loss currently, right? Yeah, we're operating at a loss. So is BuzzFeed. So is Vice. Um, so is the Times of London. I mean, you can you can you can have the most perfect paywall, or you can be throwing money at innovation um, because you believe there's going to be a pot of gold at the end. Um, so I don't think anybody has cracked it. But I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm always struck by when when people write about BuzzFeed or Amazon, which is another company I don't think has ever made a profit. You know, they are. Or Twitter, you know, people think there's, these are companies that could be valued in billions because the potential is, is amazing and it would be crazy not to invest. Uh, and then people carp and say oh, it's a terrible thing if a, if a newspaper company is trying to invest in the future. So yeah, sure, we're, sure we're losing money. I think you're, you're, um, it would be a, a miracle for a paper like The Guardian to make money at the moment. But again, with a trust not behaving stupidly with its endowment, but allowing us to invest, uh, I think that's the right use for the money that we have at the moment. It's been a couple of months into the Guardian's decision to put climate change front and center and to push forward the, the divestment movement. What surprised you so far? If if you had to look back at, at your original mm. Christmas Eve email, um, what, what would you have been surprised at, at what's transpired? Well, I suppose in my heart, I thought this was going to be a... Um, a campaign about the morality, you know, that this was something that was like South Africa or like tobacco, and that people would approach this and say, well, these are moral choices that we have to make. And I think that is true. But I've been more surprised, I think, by the degree to which the financial community is onto this uh, in ways that are not guided by morality, but just simply going to, back to Bill McKinnon's numbers, <laughs> they're looking at this and they're saying, wow, this is dangerous territory. Um, you know, when the governor of the Bank of England stands up and says in, you know, governorish language, uh, this is, you know, people ought to think about where their money is invested in fossil fuels and the same kind of warnings are coming out of the IMF and the World Bank. I think what what's happening is the financial community can see a big subprime-like issue coming along and are waving big red flags so that, for instance, when the Guardian Media Group was, you know, obviously had to think about this because, you know, otherwise we would be accused of dreadful hypocrisy. Um, but the the business people on the investment committee, when they thought about that, they, they of course, they thought about the moral issues. They, I think they thought, actually, it had never occurred to us that that there is a, a that the, the, these companies that we think are safe as houses are actually could actually be grossly overvalued. So I've been really surprised that uh, that how widespread the opinion within you know, not the Guardian reading community at all, you know, fund managers and 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 bankers and central bankers uh, are in a in a sense ahead of us. So it. It's it's very hard to pigeonhole this as a you know greeny lefty vegetarian issue because actually it's about real money. When you have everyone from uh, the Vatican to yeah the World Bank, that's yeah. a pretty pretty wide swath. Mm. You know, uh, if if people think this is a minority position at the moment, I I think it will it's going to snowball and turn into a majority position soon enough. And are you optimistic? I mean, uh, this it's a very, very big and, and daunting problem, uh, one that 
literally threatens everything. There seems to have been some some genuine momentum, both with uh, your campaign and just various other things happening this year. Where's your either sense of anxiety or optimism at, at the moment when it comes to climate change? Well, I think I think it's incredibly balanced, finely balanced. I think um, there are there are things going on in India at the moment where you, where you think there's going to be a gigantic battle between coal and solar there, and and who wins there, and where the money is there is going to be incredibly important. Uh, the people I'm talking to who are in, in the lead up to Paris are, you know, so Paris is the, is going to be the next big political negotiation. Are, reasonably optimistic. But I, I think a combination of what we're doing in the divestment bit of it and the technological changes. So what, what people are saying is that the, 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 the argument about divestment could play into the argument about where the subsidies are. We published a story today, which I think is again an IMF figure saying that I think it's ten million dollars a minute is going into subsidies into fossil fuels, at the same time as the uh, the price of solar panels is really dropping, and people feel they're beginning to make significant progress on the, the issues about storage. So it could be that we're we're approaching a moment where the money could start shifting into uh, renewables, at the same time as the technology is coming through. The political will is coming through. So and I, I think I'm inclined to be cautiously optimistic. I think I'm more optimistic than I thought I would be six months into this campaign. And finally, what would you say the media's role in climate change and maybe more broadly is? Uh, do you see it as, as a, a force for change? Do you almost see it as uh, irresponsible for journalists who cover the environment not to um, make it more of a, of a campaigning issue? Well, think about think about how big the story is, and you know, if you're an editor or a or a news editor, read up some of the science, um, read read up some of these IPCC reports. I mean, just try and try and educate yourself about why it is that so many scientists believe the same thing, and then consider the nature of the threat. But you know, when when has there ever been a situation where, as journalists, you're writing about? such a mass threat to millions, maybe billions of people on the planet within the lifetime of, of people who are now born. I mean, that, that seems to me a, a colossal story. And if we as journalists haven't got the imagination to work out how to cover that and deal with it, then there's something failing in journalism. And I think we ought to sit and reflect on what that is and what our responsibilities are. Well, Alan Respiriger, thanks so much for the, the work that The Guardian is doing on this issue. And, and thanks for joining me today. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this um, talk. It's made me think.